Hi, I'm Andy, and in this video we'll be exploring how to attack, detect, and defend against the abuse of Windows admin shares. Windows systems come built in with a number of default network shares, which allow for files and folders to be shared between different machines. Each drive has a share of the same name as each drive letter, with a dollar sign appended to the end. The folder where Windows is installed, usually C drive Windows, is shared as admin dollar. A share called IPC$ doesn't link to a real folder on a file system, but is instead used for inter-process communication. Domain controllers have additional shares, such as NetLogon, which typically contains scripts run as part of the user logon process, and Sysvol, where group policies can be found. Many of these shares have a dollar sign at the end of their name. That means they're hidden from view when browsing via the Windows Explorer GUI but we can use the net view command to see hidden shares, so long as the slash all option is used. Here you can see the usual three hidden shares on a Windows workstation, C$, Admin$, and IPC$. Any attacker who's managed to acquire credentials for a user with local admin rights can connect to these shares and read, add, modify, and delete files with ease. This can be a particularly effective way of stealing files from a large number of machines if the credentials are for a domain user who's been granted local admin access to a large number of workstations, or if many workstations all share the same password for the locally defined built-in administrator account. And it's not just about the theft of data. The same scenario allows an attacker to push out malware across an entire organization too. Just writing some malware to the disks of other workstations isn't quite enough though. An attacker needs to get that code executed. This could be done by overwriting existing commonly used programs and waiting for a user to spring the trap. But there's also a couple of options for immediate execution through either a scheduled task or a Windows service as both have APIs which allow for remote administration. This whole process is made a lot easier by the PSExec tool part of the sysinternals package. It automates the process of copying a shim application to the target device, then creating a new Windows service to run it. The shim is used to establish a communications channel to then execute the intended code. Although originally designed to help system administrators manage their environment, PSExec is also commonly used by various malicious actors as part of their attack chain. In this example, a malicious user has acquired the username and password of an account with local admin rights and is launching the psexec command in interactive mode. This provides a command line shell on the target machine for further exploitation. The attacker could have specified the name of any executable on the victim machine instead of CMD. Alternatively, if the victim machine doesn't yet have a copy of an attacker's custom payload, the attacker may use the dash C option to transfer an executable from their machine to the victim. This example also demonstrates the use of the dash D option, which causes the target executable to be run in non-interactive mode, or in other words, leaves the malicious payload running even after the attacker has disconnected. Detecting an active PS exec session can be easy if an attacker is sloppy. A quick examination of the list of running services shows the service which is created by psexec. This gets removed, however, once an interactive session is terminated. It's also worth noting that an attacker can change the name that this service displays as by using the dash R option. This makes it fairly trivial for an attacker to defeat any detection based purely on the name of that psexe SBC service although event log entries are created whenever a new service is installed. Any new service, regardless of its name, should be considered suspicious. Detecting the use of shares in general is relatively simple with Windows event logging. Particular events of interest are 4624, the logon event, and 5140, generated when a network file share is accessed. Logon events, where the logon type is three, indicate a network-based logon indicative of accessing a file share. 5140 events include the name of the share being accessed. 
5145 events show detailed information about the access. Here showing the upload of the totally not genuine service executable to C drive windows. Another useful detection mechanism is to monitor network traffic. In most environments, workstations will be communicating on Windows file sharing ports with a central file server or domain controller. There's no particular need for a workstation to communicate directly with other workstations. Any such traffic should be considered highly suspicious in the majority of corporate environments. Monitoring can be achieved by configuring wired network switches or wireless access points to record details of the communications they see. A full packet capture is overkill and hard to process at scale, but capturing NetFlow data is ideal. As the name suggests, this captures information about the flows of traffic across the network, but not the content of that traffic. But that's perfect for detecting workstation to workstation traffic over Windows file sharing ports. It would be fair to assume that the easiest way to stop these attacks is to just stop sharing these folders altogether. Windows has other ideas, however. The Windows 10 Explorer pretends that these folders aren't being shared. We have to resort to the command line to remove them, although it's somewhat futile. If you do manage to remove any of these shares, they'll automatically get created next time the machine boots. Microsoft has published a registry tweak that turns off this automatic recreation behavior although they don't really recommend it as it could cause difficulties with genuine remote management tasks or tools. A great way to limit the potential damage caused by the abuse of admin shares is to ensure that the same set of credentials don't provide admin access across a large number of devices. This conflicts with a system administrator's desire to be able to manage a fleet of devices across an enterprise, and having different admin credentials for each is difficult to keep track of manually. There is, however, a great alternative in the form of LAPS, Microsoft's local administrator password solution. Once configured, this service automatically changes the local administrator account password to a new random value every day, and crucially, a different value for each device. Then, if the account is needed for a genuine administrative purpose, the password can be retrieved via a small app. In the previous section, I mentioned a strong detection control is to monitor for any workstation to workstation traffic on Windows file sharing ports. You can of course upgrade this to a defensive control by removing the ability for devices to communicate altogether. This can be achieved on a single Wi-Fi network by enabling guest isolation mode or in larger or wired networks through access control lists. Just bear in mind that there may be routes for an attacker to work around such restrictions if end user devices are still permitted connectivity to designated file servers. An attacker could find a way to pivot onto these authorized servers and launch their attack from there. So don't just blindly block traffic. Ensure that any block traffic also generates alerts which are then investigated. That about wraps up this video. If you found it useful, please do give it a like and consider subscribing if you want more of this sort of content. Drop a note in the comments if there's anything you think I've missed around attacking, detecting and defending against the abuse of Windows admin shares, or if you have a good idea of what topic I should cover next. I'll see you next time.